Uh, I told you that today was a very special day for us, and uh, we are also welcoming our Blue Island campus today. Would you help me in welcoming all of them in Blue Island? Uh, they're joining us for this service, as well as those who have joined us online today uh, for our special guest. Uh, Brian Loritz is with us. Uh, several years ago, I read a book that Brian had written called Right Color, Wrong Culture, and it has been very instrumental here. We've used this, used this with our leadership team here, and uh, I've even stolen bits and pieces of it in some sermons in the past, but uh, uh, it's been a real blessing to us. And then uh, just recently, he came out with another book, Insider, Outsider, uh, his journey as a stranger in white evangelicalism and uh, his hope for all of us, it says. I, uh, I started at uh, this week and couldn't put it down. I, you don't know me that, that well to know what my bedtime is probably, but I was up until midnight until I finished that thing because I just couldn't set it aside. And we do have both of his books uh, at the book. Well, he's written more than those two. We have both of these books at the book table today if you'd like to help yourself to one after the service. But uh, I am just delighted to have Brian here. We've been been doing a series all this month uh, on uh, the various divisions that have plagued mankind almost from the beginning, and he's here today to close that out for us. Pastors a mega church in the Bay Area of California, but uh, I believe more than anything else, he's here on assignment today, and so I want you to give your very best welcome to Brian Loritz from California. God bless. <laughs> Well, thank you, Pastor. I was glad when they said unto me, let us come to CLC. It is a joy to be here, although this weather, boy, I can't wait to get back to California. Seriously, uh, no hyperbole at all. When it rains in California, I can count on a 20% decrease in church attendance. The saints do not come in the rain. So give yourself a high five. Look at you. You came in the rain. Someone said, this ain't nothing, Pastor. It's stay around another day or two. So my wife is from Evanston. She is a, a die-hard Bears fan uh, all the way. In fact, uh, uh, number one on her bucket list is a Bears-Packers game at Soldier Field. In fact, I got her tickets. I'll be back in three weeks to brave a, the cold. For a team, no offense, y'all, I don't, I don't care anything about. Someone says that's love. That's, that's love. So what a joy it is to be here with you. I want to um, hurry up and make the best use of our time. Uh, I asked the pastor, how long do I have? Whenever I'm a guest in someone else's church, I always ask that question. It reminds me of the time. Not too long ago, I was preaching in a Presbyterian church in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I said to the pastor, Pastor, um, how long do I, do I have to preach here? You know, Presbyterians can be tight on their time. And he shocked me. He said, oh, oh, pastor, we are a spirit-filled, spirit-led church. Time means nothing to, to us here. You take as long as you'd like, pastor, but the people leave at 12. <laughs> so someone said, we ain't leaving at 12. We leaving way before then. Let me say a word of prayer and we can get into it. Father, we bless you already. We've experienced your presence in corporate worship. Thank you for those on the band, the worship team who have led us, Father. Already your presence is palpable here and across uh, other campuses. Thank you for the great work that you are doing here. Thank you for the leadership here. God, we pray your continued hand of favor and anointing on them and on this house. Thanks for the lives that have been changed here. Thanks for every soul that has been saved, every marriage that has been strengthened, every wayward sinner who has been called back home in repentance and renewal of fellowship. God, this is a great work here. And I pray, Lord God, that the days ahead would be greater than the days behind. In Jesus' name we ask. Now, Lord God, as the old African-American preachers would often pray, would you stand in my body, think with my mind, and speak with my tongue those things you'd have us know, say, and do. Deliver a word imparted into your people through me, a very broken, flawed, and cracked vessel. Use me in spite of me. It is in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen, amen. and amen.
If you have your Bibles, please meet me in Hosea chapter 3. Uh, I was thrilled when uh, your pastor reached out to me and told me the series that you all have been uh, walking through these last couple of weeks. And it's been a bold series as you all have talked about safe topics like race and gender and class and so on and so forth. In this day of division, we, we need uh, to venture into these dangerous spaces, spaces that the church talks about. And we need to stop looking at the White House to do what the church house should be doing. The White House is not supposed to be leading the way. It's God's people. It's God's church who should be setting the agenda. When I got off the phone with your pastor, I'd agreed to talk about race. And, um, and last night I, I, was, I was thinking through what should I, what particular passage I should talk about, and we are going to hint at the subject. But I just got to thinking that if we don't talk about this one thing, then the previous three weeks or so will not have mattered. If you don't have this one ingredient in your life, then the last several weeks will just be a session in information gleaning and gathering. You've got to have this in order for the former things to work. A young man sat down for a conversation with an elderly woman. And not long into the conversation, he noticed that situated on the coffee table between he and this elderly woman was a dish filled with what looked like the most delightful, delectable peanuts he had ever seen in his life. He was entranced by these peanuts, so much so that he interrupted this elderly woman who was sharing her heart mid-conversation and says, ma'am, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but, but these peanuts look off the chain. Do you mind, ma'am, if I have some of your peanuts? This elderly lady was clearly taken by surprise. She paused for a few seconds gathered her thoughts while she was doing that the young man was thinking to himself this is rather rare I'm just making a simple request for some peanuts why does it look like I've asked her for a million dollars and finally a few seconds later this elderly woman acquiesced she says yes young man you may have some the conversation continued and he began popping these peanuts in his mouth when a few moments later much to his chagrin he looked down horrified into an empty dish he interrupted this elderly woman yet again and says, ma'am, I'm so sorry. I'm from the South and my mama raised me better than that, ma'am. But here I am, a guest in your house, and I done ate up all your peanuts. But I got to tell you, ma'am, these peanuts, uh, they were as good as they looked. And I've got to ask you something, ma'am. These peanuts were so off the chain, I just have to know where did you get these peanuts from? Now, clearly now this elderly woman was embarrassed. She turned a bright shade of red, paused even longer, what felt like at least 10 minutes, when in reality was no longer than about 15 to 20 seconds. Again, this young man is thinking to himself, what in the world is going on? I'm just asking her where she got the peanuts from. You would think I asked her where she got her Garrett's popcorn from, Chicago style, of course, but I did not ask her for all of that. I, what is going on? Finally, she pulled herself together and she says, well, young man, as you can see, I am an elderly woman and as such if you've noticed I have no teeth now those peanuts used to be covered in chocolate but since I could not chew them I just sucked the chocolate off and spit them right back into the dish the moral of the story is not everything is as it appears and what's true of once chocolate co covered peanuts is tragically true of so many people who think they're saved. But in reality, they are not. In Matthew chapter 7, as Jesus is reaching the crescendo of the great Sermon on the Mount, he shocks some church attending religious leaders. He says to them, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord will enter into the kingdom of heaven. He was talking not just to folk who came to church for the first time, he's talking to leaders of the synagogue. He's talking to folk who memorize the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, 
Leviticus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. He was talking to people who tithed regularly, who showed up and served and even taught the scriptures. And yet he tells these people, you think you're saved. But in reality, you are not. As my grandmama used to say, not everybody talking about heaven is going. It was C.S. Lewis who once said that when we get to heaven, we will be surprised on two fronts. One, we'll be shocked at who is there that we knew for sure would not be there. And two, we'll be shocked at who is not there that we knew for sure would be there. Salvation is a mystery. So how do I know that I'm saved? Jesus tells us in that same chapter when he says, you shall recognize them not by the size of their Bible. You shall recognize them not by the way they talk, but you shall recognize them by their fruit. Fruit is a changed and changing lifestyle that cannot be blamed on the normal maturation process of adulthood. But fruit is a changed and changing lifestyle that can only be blamed on the indwelling, filling, empowering ministry of the Holy Spirit. That is why Paul in writing to the Galatians says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And it is no coincidence that the lead-off batter to the list is love. How do I know that I'm saved? John chapter 13, Jesus would say it this way. By this will all men know that you're my disciples. Not by the arguments you win on Facebook. But by this will all men know that you're my disciples. Not by the consecutive quiet time streak you're on. But by this will all men know that you're my disciples. It is by your love for one another. An unloving Christian is an oxymoron. It is a contradiction in terms. How do I know that I'm saved? How do I know that I'm the real deal? How do I know that I'm authentically redeemed by a God who so loved the world and by a Jesus who so loved me that he gave his only life? How do I know John says it this way? We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brothers. Love is the birthmark of the believer. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, Now abideth faith, hope, and love these three. But the greatest of these is love. I'm so glad you talked about race, but if you don't love the ethnically other, you ain't redeemed. I'm so glad you talked about crossing gender lines, but if you don't even love folks who are same-sex attracted. God doesn't call us to write position papers on them. God calls us to love. But the question on the table I want to explore with you the next 26 minutes that we have together is what exactly does it mean to love somebody? Pastor, you've been hanging out at 35,000 feet. I, I need you to bring this down to my living room. I, I, I need you, as my grandmama used to say, to put shoe leather on this word. What exactly does it mean to love? It was Robert Smith Jr., the great professor at, at that divinity school, Beeson Divinity down in Alabama, who says every New Testament point has an Old Testament picture. Every New Testament point has an Old Testament picture. If the New Testament point is that what authenticates your relationship with Jesus is your love, and we're exploring the question, what does it really mean to love? Then the seminal picture of love is Hosea chapter 3. I want you to turn there with me right now. Let me read the whole chapter to you. Chill out. It's just five verses. 
Hosea writes in Hosea 3, And the Lord said to me, Go again, love. There it is, love. Love a woman who is loved by another man and is, not used to be, is, not was, an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. Verse 2, underline it. So I bought her, here it is, for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore, belong to another man, so will I also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Afterwards, verse 5, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. What does it look like to love? What does it look like to love A white person, maybe, who has wronged me. What does it look like for me to love a Latino person or an African-American person whom I've been culturally conditioned to look down on? What does it look like to love that gay couple? What does it look like not to tolerate them? Tolerance is such a low ethic. I tolerate you. But what does it really mean to love? Hosea 3 tells you everything you need to know about love. Because when we come to the book of Hosea, God is frustrated. He pulls Hosea to the side and he says, Hosea, I've got a problem on my hand. And my problem is I have entered into covenant. I have married Israel and Israel, my bride, is a serial adulteress. She keeps on cheating on me by God's words, not mine, whoring after other gods. Oh, if I can come by your house today, I tell you that every time we sin, we commit spiritual adultery. We compromise the covenant we have entered into with God. And yet God tells Hosea, that's not my real problem. My real problem is not so much that I've married a serial philanderer, but my real problem is in my holiness and in my grace, I cannot divorce her. I am with her. In fact, Hosea, she needs to know that I have entered into not contract, but covenant. You need to know contracts are performance oriented. Contracts are you do your part and someone else does their part. And if you've performed well enough, then you'll keep the job. You'll keep the relationship. That's not how God rolls with you. When God said, I do with you, it was not based on a contract. It was not based on a performance. If it was, you wouldn't have made it out the first day. But God's relationship with you is a covenant. It is a binding agreement that he will never give up on you, that God has more mercy than you've got mess. I'm wondering if this microphone is on. If I was back home, that's a good place for someone to shout, do a couple laps, that God has more mercy than you've got mess. And here's God telling Hosea, I can't divorce my wife. I'm faithful to her. It's not based on her performance. And I want to show her how much I love her. And Hosea, I was thinking about using you as my divine show and tell for how much I love my people. I wonder, Hosea maybe shoots back at God and he says, well, God, what are you thinking? You mean preach a sermon? God says, not quite. Well, God, what are you thinking? You mean write a book? Well, that'll come later. Hosea, here's what I want you to do. I know you just graduated from seminary, Hosea. I I know you just graduated the MDiv, got called to your first church. And I also know, Hosea, you're single and I've got a wife picked out for you. Can't you see Hosea smiling and getting all excited? Who is she, God? And I can see God quoting Rick James when he says, calm down. She ain't the kind of girl you'll take home to mama. Her name is Gomer. Now, that's the first. I ain't never met a cute Gomer in my life. Sorry if your name is Gomer. Um, In chapter one, he says she's a prostitute. That's right here that if I'm Hosea, my smile dissipates. 
I'm saying, wait a minute, God, don't you understand? I, I'm a prophet. You want the prophet to be with a prostitute? You want the man of God to be with the woman of the night? God, no, 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 no. I, I can just see on my installation Sunday, walking down the center aisle, the prophet with the prostitute. God, that's too strange. And God says, Hosea, that's exactly the point. In fact, I can give you a stranger sight. The fact that I, a holy God, walk with you is a stranger sight. The problem with Christianity is we have gotten far too tribal. There's no strangeness to our love. You can literally walk down the street and go, that's the Fox News Church, that's the MSNBC Church over there, that's the CNN Church over there, that's the black church, that's the white church, that's the Hispanic church. There's no strangeness to our love. What's even more indicting is if people today are still primarily coming to church out of relationships then sanctuaries reflect dinner tables. So if your sanctuary ain't strange, if it ain't eclectic, if it ain't diverse, what does that say about your dinner table? Jesus, I know, Went to some strange places. Jesus, God in the flesh, hung out at dinner tables with tax collectors and sinners. The Jesus I know got a degree in transgressing tribal lines. He went to Samaria, sat down at a well with a woman in the middle of the day who was a Samaritan. That, that's strange. How strange are your friendships? Can I go there? My youngest son is a, is a baller. When we lived in New York City, he played on a couple all-city, all-star teams, get to the Bay, and uh, currently he's on the sixth-ranked team in California. We call him RP around my house, retirement plan. His first tournament, at, we had just moved to the Bay. His first tournament was in San Francisco, and my son's a two-guard. And we sit there, and we, we, we end up befriending two women who are married to each other, whose son is the point guard on our team. At the end of that tournament, we exchanged phone numbers. My wife and I hopped in our car and made the long journey from San Francisco back to where we live in San Jose. And on the way back, my wife and I said to each other in so many terms, what if God is calling us not to change them? Newsflash, we can't change anybody, not even ourselves. But what if God is calling us? To love them. So we invite them over to the house. And those early meetings were really strange. They were doing what couples do. Public displays of affection at my dinner table. I grew up in the South. In a time when it wasn't open. And it was strange for me. And we're having good conversation. And the whole time I'm thinking to myself, please don't ask me what I do for a living. <laughs> and all through that fall season, they don't. Top of spring season, they're over one day. And one of them says, well, Brian, we've been hanging out for a while. We've never asked you, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a pastor. I tell people how to find true meaning, value, significance in life through God's only son, Jesus Christ. One of them got up from the table, muttered under her breath, didn't see that coming, grabbed her purse, was going to make her way out my house. And I'm thinking to myself, and y'all call us judgmental? 
as a pastor, I can't say everything that I think. So I cracked a joke, get her to come back. We finished the evening and we repair the relationship. A couple months later, they call me and says, look, our son's getting to the age where we feel like he needs a positive male role model. And we think it's you, Brian, so much so that we've moved out of our house and have rented a house in your neighborhood because we feel like you need to be spending time with our son." They're an atheist couple and they invited me over. They said, would you do our house blessing? I says, as in pray to God. <laughs> they said, do your thing. And I come over there, my wife and I. And when we get over there from the looks of things, it is. It is as if we're the only straight couple in the place. Strange. The whole time. One of their friends is taking pictures of us. And the next day, it's a Monday, my wife texts me at, at work. She says, honey, they done tagged us on Facebook. <laughs> Strange. A couple hours later, one of the dear sweet mothers in our church. <laughs> Bless her heart. 80 something years old. I pick up the phone. She says, Pastor, I was on Facebook. <laughs> now, I don't mean no harm, but when an 80 something year old tells you she was just on Facebook, that's scary. <laughs> Her words, not mine. Is my pastor hanging out with homosexuals? Because the Jesus I know wouldn't hang out with homosexuals. Now, there's a verse in the Bible I don't like. It says, do not rebuke an older person. I don't like that verse. I don't like it because I know some older folk who need to be rebuked. I said, mother, you might want to look at Jesus again. Because the Jesus I know went to some strange places. A couple months later, we, we were headed out on vacation, and we said to them at the end of one of the games, hey, we're going to New York City, then down to a Christian camp in South Carolina. We'd love to take your son with us on vacation. We'll take care of everything. I know you all have to talk about it, think about it, discuss it, get back to us, but we'd love to take your son. They said, on the spot, we don't need to think about it. He can go. On the last night of camp, Christian camp, that young man came to me. Without any kind of solicitation on my behalf, he says, Mr. Loritz, I've been spending two weeks with you. I want to know how I can become a follower of Jesus Christ. I just led him to faith in Jesus Christ, just baptized him. And his mom said to me, we want to come to the baptism. But is your church a safe place for us? Because the churches we've been to before are not safe for us. I says, when you come, you sit on the front row next to me. The pastor sitting next to two lesbians strange before I got here the one mom says I want to talk about being a member of your church I says now you know what that means we got to talk about you and Jesus she says I'm ready to have that talk what got that boy on a plane on vacation was love what got him saved was love what got his mamas to church was not a theological argument. It was love. But in order for me to do that, I had to take a risk and step out of my little Christian cul-de-sac and hang out with folk who don't look like, act like, think like, or vote like me. How strange are your relationships? We don't know 
know when it happened. But by the time we get to chapter 3, something done gone down. By the time we get to chapter 3, this prophet is separated from his wife. We can piece together the circumstantial evidence. It is her fault because the text says she is an adulteress, which means somewhere after the marriage vows, her old sexual proclivities got the best of her and she cheated on him. If I'm Jose, I'm going, well, that's great. I I didn't want to be in this thing anyways. I'm going to exercise my right in the word of God, the law, and divorce her. And God shocks him by saying, listen, Hosea, remember, your marriage ain't about your marriage. It's an illustration for how I treat my people. And if every time you messed up with me, I wiped my hands clean of you, you wouldn't have made it out the first day. So here's what I need you to do, Hosea. I need you to do the godly thing, the loving thing, and go again. Go again. If every time someone violates you, if, if, if every time someone gossiped about you, lied about you, slandered you, you just cut them off and emotionally moonwalked, you ain't loving. In fact, what this text teaches us as an aside note is one of the primary ways I know I'm show enough saved is not just how I treat folk I like, it's how I handle folk who don't like me and who have hurt me. So he says, I need you to go again. I love it. Verse 2. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. I wish I had time to unpack this, but scholars tell us that the going rate to emancipate a woman who who was being sex trafficked like Gomer was 30 shekels. So why doesn't the text say... I bought her for 30 shekels. Why all the detail? I bought her for 15 shekels and a homer and a lethic of barley. Why all the detail? Answer, he didn't have 30 shekels. I I can see him now rummaging in his house, digging in between the cushions of his sofa, looking under his bed, scraping together all of his currency, going to the auctioneer saying, I I got 15 shekels, will you take this? Auctioneer says no. He he negotiates. What if I added a homer and a lethic of barley? That's all I've got. Here's the tripped out part to emancipate the person who wronged him. He literally had to go to the auctioneer Bankrupt. Love is not only strange, but if it don't cost you nothing, it ain't love. But ain't ain't that our problem? We want Nordstrom quality community at thrift store prices. We don't want to be inconvenienced. We don't want to have to sacrifice. We don't want to have to put up with other folks' idiosyncrasies and eccentricities. And some of y'all, this is real because we just coming off of Thanksgiving. Some of us, you got one time to wrong us and we're done. If every time someone violates you, you cut them off and you cut them off and you cut them off, you're going to go to your grave a very lonely individual. If it doesn't cost, if it doesn't inconvenience you, It ain't love. Watch it. I'm almost done. Watch it now. If I end the message right here, I make love to be this spineless thing. But watch what Hosea says. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. Watch it. And I said to her, you must no longer play the whore. Love has a standard. 
if there is no standard, it's, it's this cheap worldly thing called tolerance. Tolerance says it's just your truth. I ban that phrase at my church. We, we're not allowed to say that, my truth. You don't get to a stop sign and go, well, what is my truth telling me? <laughs> there is an objective standard. Hosea, here's what he's saying. If this relationship is going to work, we have to adhere to a standard. So when this lesbian couple came to me a couple months ago and said, Brian, we'd love for you to do our vow renewal ceremony. I said to them, am I allowed to think differently and not be called a bigot? They said, well, what do you mean? I says, I can't do your vow renewal. Now come over for Thanksgiving. Come over for the barbecue. Let's put on some music and Cupid shuffle to the left. To the, let's do all that. <laughs> and the relationship didn't miss a beat. Why? Because I had been making a lot of love deposits. Love has a standard. As we end, I've really been preaching this wrong. I've been giving you the secondary application. The primary application has to do with God's love for us. In other words, the primary application is not so much how we treat other people, because we'll never treat other people the way God treats us unless we first see ourselves as Gomer. Until you realize I was the one who needed saving. I was the one toe up from the flow up. I was the one a hot mess. I was the one headed for an eternity in hell, but God in great grace reached down and saved me from an eternity of damnation from him until you have the humility to say, I'm Gomer. You'll never reach out to other Gomers. What this demands is you get rid of your self-righteousness. See, we love to rank sins. Okay, so your thing ain't homosexuality. But I got a thing. You got a thing. All God's children got a thing. And the church ain't a massage parlor. Where we just make you feel good. It's, it's, it's a physical therapy place where we, we stretch the areas that hurt. Where we step into the brokenness. And we say all are welcomed here. But if you play around with grace, grace ain't going to leave you there. Because until you see that a holy God with us is strange. And until you see that on the cross, Jesus Christ paid his 15 shekels. And Homer and Alethic of barley for we sinners. And until we see that he calls us to a standard and when we fail, he gives us grace to fill in the gaps until you say, I am Gomer. You'll never love white people. You'll never love Hispanics. You'll never love black folk. You'll never love our friends in the gay community. Until you understand God's great love for you. So, Father, we bless you in this place today. We give you honor. We give you praise. We give you glory. Thank you, God, for loving us. That you love us so much that you gave your only son. God, I've got three sons. 
As I tell my church all the time, I, I love them so dearly. But as much as I love my church, I wouldn't give up one of my three. And yet, God, your word says that you loved us so much you gave up your only. And Jesus, you loved us so much you laid down your life for us. And to be Christian means in some way, shape or form, you are calling us to mimic that love. And so I pray, Lord God, that this church across its campuses, it would be known as those loving people. It would be known as that strange church. It would be known as that church that reaches out across the divide, not in a in a sense of tolerance, Lord God, this church has standards. It preaches the word of God. It calls people to righteousness and holiness. But it does so packaged in grace and mercy and forgiveness. Because this church has come to realize we're all goners. If you're here today and you would say, I, I don't know Christ as Lord and Savior. I have not received this strange love. Maybe there's a sense in you in which you look down at those deep, dark places in your life and you say, well, wait a minute. If God knew this about me, let me go ahead and burst your bubble. He knows. And not only does he know, God says, I still want you. Oh, that's amazing. God sees all but still wants you. just a few moments, the pastor's going to come and he's going to show you how you can become a follower of Jesus Christ. So Father God, as the pastor comes, I, I pray one more prayer. Rid this house, rid these campuses of judgmentalism, of a self-righteous spirit that somehow, some way thinks that they're better than people. May they be people of authentic love in Jesus' name.